All right, we seem to be live on YouTube. Uh, Marshall is asking, um, I've been struggling in going past exercise one on Starlings. Uh, are you part of the Discord server? That's the best place to try to get support. But I mean, feel free to use the chat if you to paste the any any error you have while we wait for more people to join. Maybe we can just take a look to see what's happening. Okay, you're not on Discord. Let me see the link. It's uh, six fifty eight p.m. on my side. It starts technically at seven, but we wait until seven or five to give some chance people to join. So feel free to ask any question in the meantime. Just try to find the link to Discord. <clears throat> So Marshall, once you join the Discord server, we have a Basecamp channel over there. So uh, we have a Basecamp channel, but also we have like a Scarf channel and a Starknet Foundry. So those are places where you can get actually uh, support if you get stuck. Hi, Falco. Ah, oh, Nestor says that it's, you don't see the live. You don't see the live. I think it's because it is um, unlisted. Try this link. The reason that I put it unlisted is because I only, I'm do only doing the, the live stream just because there's people doing a, a hackathon uh, uh, with the Starkware. And they also wanted to have that information. I didn't want to make it open to everyone just because I want people to come and join the Zoom call because otherwise I actually don't know who's watching the live stream, right? I wouldn't be able to tell if you actually watch it or not or participate in. But the live stream is what I use for the recording. So as soon as the session ends, I actually stop the recording or stop the streaming and make it public in the playlist of, uh, of Basecamp 8. How are you guys doing with the Starlings? How many of you actually completed even ahead of time? Because uh, there were some questions about Starnet that we just want to cover today. Seven oh one. Four more minutes and we start. Hi, Okai. Hi, Andre. Okay, Okai has it, has it done. I think for a while. I think I saw you share that on Discord as well. That's good. Carlos is here too. Mm -hmm. Uh, Marshall says that the invite to Discord is paused for now. That happens sometimes. Um, Discord tends to be under attack sometimes with scammers and the like. So they might pause temporarily uh, people joining. I see that joints are paused for starting until 2-2, two, two, which is tomorrow. So try again tomorrow in the afternoon or, or evening. <laughs> Three more minutes and we get started. Today will be another session of uh, live coding. This time is not going to be a startling, it's going to be 
a couple of workshops, at least one workshop that one of my colleagues at the foundation created. So we're going to be doing that. We're going to try to deploy it in the final version of the workshop to testnet to Gurley. And if we have time, we can actually start a second workshop that we have, but I don't know how much time we're going to have because it could take a while. This time, I want you two guys to cut along with me. So I'm going to give some time for you guys to solve the exercises and then I'll, I'll solve it in front of you. So you, if you get stuck, you just can follow along what I'm doing. Hi, Ibrahim. When you use the chat, the chat please uh, select the option to chat to everyone instead of just hosts and panelists. Nestor is asking, what is the best workflow to submit changes to a StarNet book, Cairo book? Uh, the best way is just to go to, to the GitHub repo and submit a PR there. It's as uh, simple as that. At the end, it's just markdown files that you can just, you know, modify. Oh, Jordan said there's a Telegram group. I didn't know that. Good. <clears throat> Mm, okay, Jordan said that if you authorize via only dust, you will be paid. Yeah, only dust is a great app for you guys to check it out and to get paid for doing contributions to projects or to the book and stuff like that. Basically, if I share the screen in the meantime, let me share, you see only dust. So only dust. This is the platform where you actually you can get paid for submitting contributions to open source projects on Starnet. I should be able to log in. Anyway, here you see all the different projects where you can actually participate. And the Cairo book is here as well. So that's what Jordan was talking about. Ibrahim is asking, I want to ask you if this is my first webinar. I hope I'm not late. I've been trying to learn Cairo for a while, but I've been able to find someone to put me through. And I know about, about Stargate, but not the development part. The development of Stargate will make me complete. Um, I think the Discord server is the best place to get some support if you get stuck, uh, Ibrahim. I mean, if you're not a developer, it will take you a little longer, right? Because uh, you, you need to learn some of the fundamentals, but a lot of people just pick, uh, probably go to from Web2 directly to StarkNet. Uh, but yeah, the, the Cairo book is also a great place to, to be, learn more. <clears throat> oh yeah, uh, Omar actually suggested some mechanism to actually learn. Or was it exit con? I have to sign in. Uh, yeah, if if you follow Omar on, on Twitter, or if someone has the, the link uh to that Twitter thread that Omar shared, please put it in the chat as well for Ibrahim or anyone else wanted to. Ibrahim, uh, please use the options to everyone in the chat because they cannot see it. You cannot see what you're texting. You only only I can see it. Yeah, Nestor, share the link. Thank you. All right, uh, it's past seven to five, so we can actually get started now. So, this is the last session of this Basecamp eight, and this is all about Cairo smart contracts. Uh, so as a review, session one, we cover fundamentals, a little bit about architecture. Session two, deep dive, we actually went deeper into the architecture, some of the features of a StarNet. Session three, we actually learn about vanilla Cairo, in this case, just using Cairo on its own, not even on the blockchain, not even on StarNet. And we did that by solving Starlings. And then today is Cairo smart contracts. Uh, topics for today. Uh, 
I'm going to talk a bit about what are the requirements for graduation and how am I uh, defining who's actually getting the, the, the title to be a base camp graduate. Uh, we're going to then do some live coding solving these uh, counter workshop. Actually, let me share the slide with you so you can have the links. File share. Oops, not, not this. <laughs> There you go. I put the link to the slides in the chat. And I put it also on YouTube. All right, so back to slideshow. So yeah, so we're gonna solve this counter workshop and we're gonna deploy it then to testnet using uh, a CLI, then that's optional. If we have enough time, we're gonna also solve, or at least start solving another workshop of the, the ownable workshop, which is about reusable components. Uh, about the homework, you know that the homework is to solve uh, startlings. The only thing pending was the, the starting exercises, right? Because uh, that's connected to today's session. So just remember that that's going to be the homework for today, just to finish the Starling, to finish the Starling exercises from Starlings. Remember that when you finish completing this um, tutorial or interactive tutorial, just publish it on a public repo on GitHub and then register that repo on this link here, which is a Google form, just so I can go there and check that you actually completed because that's part of the graduation requirements. And you're going to have until next Friday, February 9th, to do the submission and you complete the whole of the startings, which is your homework. Uh, then I'll post on Discord on the Basecamp channel the instructions to claim the Basecamp Spock, which is a pod. Um, so make sure to do join the starting Discord so you can notify and you will know which link to use to, to claim it. Now, uh, Graduation, let's say uh, there's three levels of graduation, let's say. Uh, people who, let's say, attended at least 25% of the classes, but let's say they didn't participate in any of the quizzes, tests, or submitted any homework, you will have a spark for attendee. You're a base camp attendee, right? You're not technically a graduate, but you participated. Then we have another spark or a pop for people who actually graduate. And those are people who attend at least 50% of the live classes, I'm able to take attendance. And that score at least half of the total points in the course. And I'm going to tell you later how these points are calculated. But then I have a special pop or spark for people who did actually really good in during the course, people who attended at least, again, half the classes live, but also score. 80% or more of the total points to be awarded during the, the course. Now, the way that uh, points are being awarded is that uh, quizzes, uh, we had three quizzes, one in session one, two in session two, and each, each one of them had five questions. So it's gonna be one point per question for a total of 15 points in quizzes that you can uh, get. Then tests actually, because they're more complex, I'm awarded two points per question, and we have two tests and of 10 questions each. So that's a total of 40 points that you can obtain. And then by solving the starlings, submitting the homework, uh, that's an extra 20 points. But of course, it, it only applies if, if you if a starling is actually is, is running. If, if I run it, it actually passes all the tests saying that you actually completed starlings. But of course, we have some bonus because I know some people were not able to join live at the beginning. Maybe if you didn't well in the quizzes or, or tests, here's a chance to get extra points uh, to catch up. So the bonus activities is actually to go to Node Guardians and complete some Cara quests. So let me open Node Guardians to see, so you know what I'm seeing. So this is Node Guardians. It's a very cool platform to actually learn Cairo Solidity. And it's, it's kind of like gamified. So you earn points, you actually have a character, and you buy some uh, 
like loot for the character based on quests that you you solve. Uh, let me see if I go to quests campaigns. I can filter by Cairo. You can see that there's three quests here, right? So they have different levels of difficulty. So you can take any of the three and they have different points and these are bonus points, right? So if you solve the setting of Cairo, which is the easiest one, you get 10 extra points. If you solve thinking in Cairo, you get 15. If you solve bad accounts, you get 40 extra points, right? Uh, again, you don't have to submit any proof in this case, as in the case of the homework, because I actually can talk to an audience that they gave me a list. I actually have your GitHub username, so I can just correlate that. So I will know who did what, and the deadline is the same next Friday. So that's your chance to earn extra points and hopefully get the the cum laude uh, spark for excellence during base camp. And let me share with you the link to Node Guardians, the chat, and on YouTube Guardians. All right. So that's it. So now we can actually go and start coding. Oh, there's a question from Jordan. Uh, regarding the Starlinks completion, because I cloned the repo originally from Starlinks when I included the solutions and post to my public repo, the build fails because there is a test to see if all exercises require confirmation and I have I am not done. This isn't a problem for you review, right? Uh, so does it mean that you didn't remove the I am not done comment on the exercises? So you did remove them, and when you it, what happens? It doesn't run. The internal test failed for the build. Okay, I can take a look. But I mean, if you completed the test, that's important thing. So going back to the workshop that we're gonna to solve today, we're gonna to solve this counter workshop. So let me open it. Paulo say it was failing because the next exercise it happened to you in the live demo. Maybe that it happened to me in the demo as well. I don't remember failing. But anyway, I if I see something strange, maybe during the in the Discord server in the Basecamp channel, we can communicate. But it should be able to compile, uh, or at least execute all the tests, verify that you completed the requirements. Yeah, Nestor is willing to help as well. So if you get suck, it's better to just go to Discord and just share it there because something something's wrong. You should be able to run all the tests if you completed them. All right, so this is the workshop we're gonna be doing today. We're gonna put the link here. So you can go and take a look at it. Let me increase the font size. So this is the StarNet counter workshop. So it says, in this workshop, you'll learn how to create a simple StarNet smart contract, implement public functions, events, and extra external contract. After completing each step, run the associated script to verify it has been implemented correctly. And use the Cairo book and the StarNet docs as a reference. Okay, so first step will be to clone this repo. So let me do a couple of things before I continue. Uh, do do all of you have actually a SCARP and ASDF installed in your computers? Does any of you don't have it? Should I go through the installation of SCARP and ASDF? Uh, 
Maybe I should do it because I don't see many people reacting and I want you to quit along with me. So I'm going to start by I'm going to follow cute instructions. I'm just going to clone this repo first. So I'm going to open my terminal. Let me put it here. Let's see. How do I do this? Mm, to show you all from the scratch, maybe I should use the VM. So we start from this very beginning. Let me open the workshop here. So GitHub, start with you. What are we doing there? Counter workshop. All right, so I'm going to start by cloning this repository. Paste. And put git clone. All right? So that clones the repo. So I can get into the file, to the folder, counter, workshop. And I can open VS Code in this folder location. Okay. Okay. Increase font size. Let me know if the screen size is good enough. Font size. All right, let's continue with instructions. So we have cloned the repo, what's the next step? Now it says, create a new file called counter.cairo inside the source folder. And we're gonna copy this static code in there, right? So I'm just gonna copy this, go into my Visual Studio Code. So I'm gonna go to my source folder and I'm gonna create a new file called counter.cairo. And I'm gonna paste the code that we just copy. Boom. Now we have an issue because obviously we don't have any syntax highlighting here working, which makes me think that we might not have the Cairo extension. So let's go to search the extension and we need to get the Cairo one extension. Okay. Install it in VS Code. Don't stop install the just the carry is the car 1.0, the one that we need. I can see that there's some issue that you couldn't start the, the Cairo language server, and that is because we don't have a SCARP, so the extension doesn't know where to find the binary. Right? If I do SCARP version, there's nothing here yet, right? So we need to continue doing the, the instructions. So in the notes says You'll be working on the counter.cairo file to complete the requirements of each step. The file brief solution.cairo will show up in future steps as a way to catch up with the workshop if you fall behind. Don't modify that file. So obviously it's not here yet, but in this workshop, we're actually gonna be changing branches as we move along. And you're gonna see a new file coming up in this folder called brief solution, which basically has a solution to the previous step. So if you get stuck, you just you can take that code, put it in the country.cairo code uh, contract, and continue from there. Uh, but then we have the installation. So the next set of steps will depend on whether you prefer using Docker to manage global dependencies or not. So we have two options. One is without using Docker, and one is with Docker. Right now, I'm going to show you the one without Docker, which is installing manually, first of all, uh, ASDF, then installing the SCAR, then start the Foundry. And then I'm gonna go back to my host computer, my Mac, and I show you with Docker, if that's your preference. So first step will be to install SCARP, and it's always good to do it through ASDF. So installing through ASDF, it's... We need to install ASDF, All right? So let's search, search for it. ASDF install. 
right? These are the dogs. And the chat. And YouTube. That's what we're saying. What you can do is create a fork, then you do your changes on a new branch and finally push it to your repo. That's what I did. I guess you're talking about Stargins, Nestor? Or about this workshop? I don't know. Ah, he was answering to Jordan. Uh, okay, so ASDF, how do we install it? Font size increase. So we have here, these are the instructions, right? So we can copy this command and paste it in our terminal. It will be also in VS Code, doesn't matter where. Actually, with, uh, yeah, it's the same. Let's go and that installed in theory ASDF. Probably I will have to restart the terminal let me close it and open a new terminal. Yeah, we need to do an extra step. So to install it, or at least so the binary is available for us, there are multiple ways. You need to find the combination that makes sense to you. If you have bash and git or bash and git in Mac OS, in my case, I actually have uh, CSH and Git, right? CSH is my shell. So you can add this line to your configuration file, CSHRC, or you can add the ASDF plugin. So let's open this file. How do you know which go to choose? Uh, I think you can do echo shell. It will tell you which shell do you have. In my case, I have CSH. That's the one that is active. Maybe yours might be Bash. But in my case, I have to open this file. So I go code. I have to go to my home folder. Oops. It's HRC. Open this file. And this is where my configuration is. So if you're using my, all my C shell, so you have two options, right? Well, they tell you here that you can either copy this line and you paste it at the, at the very, like the last line, you can put it here. That's one way. Well, my preferred way, just because I have all my C shell active, is to actually add it here as a plugin. That's only if you have all my C shell, otherwise, you have to add the line at the end of your configuration file. Let me close everything for a moment in the terminal and reopen it. So I make sure that it gets all the changes. So now if I do ESDF version, now the binary is actually installed. Uh, font size. Okay. So that's the first step, having ASDF in your terminal working. So let me know, you can raise your hand if you want me to wait a little longer before I continue moving to the next step, if you need more time. Okay, I have one person that needs more time. Anyone else? Okay, let me wait a few minutes. If you want, you can keep going ahead with the workshop ahead of me. I'll catch up later. Okay, Logan, are you done? Are you okay? Just be fine. Okay. Okay, Paolo's trying to set up Docker. Okay, I'll I'll cover Docker as well. So right, so where will we be? So next step, let me go back to SCARP. So now that we have ASDF, 
we actually can use it to install SCARP uh, as a plugin. ASDF is a package manager, right? It, I, as I see it as a, maybe as a replacement, as a lightweight version of Docker, where you can actually manage global dependencies with that. Uh, I actually quite like it. So, so now we're gonna run this command. I'm gonna copy it. I'm gonna paste it here. Uh, copy, paste, come on. ASDF plugin at SCARP. All right. So we have SCARP. Good. Uh, let me go back to target EDU. To the workshop, to the instructions, because we need to install a SCARP 2.5.1 and also Foundry. So I'm going to add also the plugin for Starknet. Let me clear the screen. ASDF, plugin, add Starknet boundary. This is for the tests. So since we're working, we have now the two plugins. That's good. Let me go back to the counter workshop. So here, if I reopen, if I do, uh, if I list all the items, you can see that we have a file called tool-versions, which define which version do we need actually from SCARP and from Starnet Foundry. So if I actually show it to you, the content, you see that it's asking for Starnet Foundry 0 0.16 and SCARP 2.5.1, right? The one that we need. So I think you only need to do ASDF install, and it's gonna go and download these versions defined by the tool versions file. That's neat. So now if I do SCARP version, you see that I have the right version of the SCARP installed. And if I do SCARP SM Forge, sorry, SM Forge is one of the binaries from Stargate Foundry. It's installed. If I do SNCast, which is the command line from Foundry as well, it is installed. So we have the three global dependencies installed through ASDF, and those are defined by the tool versions file. So if I open again my VS Code, we should get syntax highlighting. At some point, let's see. Yes. Right? So at least we, we know that the extension is able to find the right discard binary and then the right chiral compiler binary. So it's all thanks to HDF and this file. Let me stop for a moment. Any questions so far? Is anyone stuck at this step? Because with this, we just completed uh, these steps here. I'm gonna move now to my my Mac. So I'm gonna stop the, the virtual machine because now I want to show you actually the Docker part. And I don't think I have Docker here. Maybe I do, let me try. Maybe I do. If I run, mm, 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 run is it tasks? Dev container. I'm not used to, to this interface of Ubuntu. Um, run, is it run? No. Man, oh, the container. All right, I have the container reopened. Okay, rebuild and reopening container. So with this command, what's gonna happen is that, first of all, you will need to have an extension called dev container, this one, in your VS code. So if you have it, you can actually uh, 
reopen VS Code inside the container. So it will have all the binaries that you need because all these binaries are going to be defined in this Docker file. This is only for people who like to use Docker. Otherwise, just stick with ASDF. I want to show you how it works. Let me see if it works here. Uh, run. Oh, yeah, no. Did I do it? Come and pull it. The container. Containers open. Find the right command. Rebuild and reopening container. I think that's the one. Ah, okay. Yeah. This is because I'm the virtual machine in parallel. So let me do it in my post machine. It will be easier to show you. Let me go back to me back to my, my Mac. I'm gonna clone. Let me open this. Let me just go back to master. Let me open here VS Code. Oop, this is my VS Code. So I should be able to, this is the final version of the code. But that's okay. What I want to show you is that I should be able to launch the dev container, reopening container. So that should be pick up this dev container file with a Docker file there as well. Relaunch VS Code inside the container. And once it's done, you can see that now I'm actually inside the container, right? And in the container, I actually should have all the dependencies that we need as well. Right? So that's the two ways. Uh, either using Docker or just installing dependencies directly with uh, ASDF. All right, let me go back to the vanilla counter contract because here I actually went ahead. Let me now, I'm just gonna close now my virtual machine to avoid confusion, I'm just gonna continue on my Mac. And I have here, right, back to the starting code in the counter Cairo. All good. So let's see the next step. So we completed, we assure you both options. So now I can actually go to step one. So it says, check out the step one branch to enable the verification test for this section, right? So I'm gonna copy this code to remove this. Symbol there could be confusing. So let me go to step one. Uh, my scap.toml was modified. Sorry, this is just because I was modifying this before. Hit check out. Mm, step one. So when you check out to step one, you should be able to see now this file, the previous solution, which basically is what we did before, which is fine. So now what they're asking us to do is that in this step, you will need to do the following. Store a variable named counter as a U32 type in the storage struct. Then you will have to implement the constructor function that initializes the counter variable with a given input value. Finally, implement a public function named get counter, which returns the value of the counter variable. So a new value in the storage, 
we pass it as in the constructor initial value and we define a function to expose it to the world. So let's start with the, the variable in the storage. So we have the storage here. We define a new variable called counter and we define the type to be u32, okay? Now they're asking us to define a constructor that is gonna get the initial value of that counter variable uh, that is gonna be set when the when we deploy this smart contract. So we define the constructor, which is a functional called constructor as well. Oops. And this function respects as the first argument, the storage of the smart contract, a reference to the storage itself, contract state, the type is always contract state for the first argument of any function of your smart contract. This is how the state, this, this storage is actually passed to all the functions to either read from it or modify it to write to it. And the other variable that we need to, uh, or argument that we need to capture is the initial value of the counter. So let's call it init counter. And the type will be the same, u32. Right? So now I'm gonna assign this initial value to the storage. So I'm gonna do self. I'm gonna access the counter variable and then the write method. And I pass the init counter argument that we collected there. So when we deploy, we pass this value, we store it in this, inside the smart contract in this variable. So now we need to find a way to expose it to the world so anyone can call a function and see what is the current value of the counter. So we need to first define an interface for this contract. So let's call it, it's gonna be a trade. Let's call it the I counter. It's usually the, the, the standard is to have the same name as the smart contract, just prefix it with an I for interface. And this trade is a generic. If you did the starlings, you probably saw generics at some point. And this uh, trait needs to be, needs to have an attribute called the Starnet interface. So it knows that it's actually the interface of, uh, of a smart contract. And the function that we want to define is get counter, right? So this get counter is gonna get us the first argument. You you can either get a reference to, to the, to T, the contract state, the generic, or you can get a snapshot, right? The difference is that if your function is, is meant to be read-only, it's not gonna modify the state, then you go for a snapshot. If your function is meant to modify the state, like use the write method, for example, then you go for the reference. So here, this one is just a read-only. And of course, it's gonna return the current value of the counter, so which is that type, U32. Is it a semicolon? Is it a comma? What is it? Yeah. So now that we have the interface, we can actually implement it here. Let me close the terminal for a moment. So I do, um, I forgot how it was. ABI. Bed, V0. Yes. All right. And I define uh, impl. So I need to create an implementation. We're gonna call it the counter impl of the i counter trait. But to make this trait visible within this module, this counter, I need to first bring it into scope. I counter. So now I can find it here. I need to provide what is the generic. And the generic is gonna be the contract state. It's always it's always the same type. Contract state. Uh, and now I have to implement actually the get counter function. Function get counter self of type is a snapshot of the contract state that returns u32. And what it does, it's simply reading the counter variable from the storage and return it. So we don't put the semicolon just to return the value. Right? So this should complete the step one. 
So let's see. Nestor is asking, is there any reason to use the more abstract T-type and not the T-contract state type, just flavor-like? Yeah, doesn't matter the name. I could have called it, you usually see it like this in the docs, but it doesn't matter the name. Al final, it's just, it's just a generic, so I just like to call it T, more concise. The name actually matters, matters is, is here, right? Because you have to define which type in particular you actually want to replace the generic with. So if this actually is correct, we should be able to run the test for this section and should pass with SCARP test. And it passed. So we actually completed the step. Questions? I did this myself, but the next one I'm actually gonna stop and just give the chance for you guys to, to do it. Falk is asking, is the generic, if the generic is always of the type contract state, why do we use a generic? Uh, the, it's a good point. It's just because this is the, the, the let's say, I guess you could, the language could introduce some, some magic to make it more straightforward, like a more concise the, the way to do it. But remember that Cairo is meant to be used even outside of smart contracts, right? If you put too much magic into it, it starts to separate the Cairo that you use for a smart contract from the Cairo that you use for general purpose programming. This way is just it's just a regular generic that you actually just pass the the state of the smart contract. But when you use it in a regular Cairo vanilla Cairo smart contract or sort of vanilla Cairo program, you might actually pass a different generic. It's just a way to make it usable in different scenarios. All right, so we go to the step. By the way, each step has hints, right? So this step, you're gonna do the step. I'm just gonna wait. And then a little later, I'll do it myself. So step two. So check out the step two branch to enable the verification test for this section. So let's go to step two. Nestor, I've been curious about naming conventions in Cairo because the I for traits is not recommended for Rust. Like I counter, uh, you mean like this? Yeah, it is strange just because talking about interfaces when you actually have a trait, but yeah, I guess it's it's your choice, right? You you don't have to prefix with an I if you don't like it. The thing is, the tests is actually expecting that to be called. Uh, it's expecting that to be prefixed with an I, otherwise the test will fail. But in your own code, you can just call it any any way you want. My tests fail originally, many, many outputs. A lot of them are about negative impulse are not enabled in the current crate. Anyone else get this? Jordan, do you have this version of SCARP? 2.5.1? Oh, fail before about the counter Cairo. Okay, so now that you have the file, actually it works. Let me know if you're stuck. Anyway, for now, I'm just gonna Go to step two, check out step two. Check. Yeah. It failed with counter the Cairo two. Well, maybe the impulse are not enabled in the current trade. You know, in this. I haven't seen that issue. Scar test fails for me. And you have this version of SN Forge, right? Interesting. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know what it is, but I'm, it's hard to see because I, I don't see it here. So debugging is difficult. Uh, anyway, so the goal of this section is to implement a function called the increase counter that increment the current value of the counter by one each time is invoked. So when you complete this goal, you should be able to run the scrap test and it will pass. 
And there's a hint. The increased counter function should be able to modify the state of the contract, also called an external function, and update the counter value within the storage. You can read more about it in this chapter of the book, external functions. So I'll give you a couple of minutes for you to do it on your own. If, you, if you're done, if you finish the step, please raise your hand for me just to keep track, but I'll give you maybe five minutes and then I'll solve it myself. Then I'm going to try searching for that error either in Discord or in Telegram to see if I can find some match. Ah, Brandon already completed the step. Let's see if someone else does it. Why right, Nestor is done as well. Just give three more minutes and I'll do it myself. All right, let me start solving the exercise now. So Brandon says, Copilot auto completed a lot of the code for me. Ah, oh, that's cool that it's working. All right, so we need to implement this function, the increase counter, okay? So that function, first of all, we need to add it to the trait, to the interface. Now the question, should it be a snapshot of the generic or should it be the, a reference? And because increased counter is actually going to modify the value of counter, it needs to be a reference of the generic that at the end is just going to be the state. And it's not going to return anything. Right? It just modifies the state and that's it. So now we actually implement this function here. Increase counter. And the type is a reference of contract state. Now we define the actual type, not the generic. And the implementation. Oh, and it's going to get passed. Oh, okay, I'm missing is, oh, I'm missing nothing. Nothing get passed and it just increase. So I'm just going to first of all collect the current value. We call it current counter. To get it from reading from the storage. And then I actually go and let's do it. New value, new counter. Current counter plus one. And now I save it again back to storage. So the counter right and new counter. You can make it even smaller just putting this code here directly, for example, but I like it to be more readable. So I think that's all we need to do for this step. So uh, so if that's okay, we should be able to run the test. 
Scarp test. And let's see. Okay, good. It passed. Perfect. We can now go to step three. So step three. In this step, you will need to do the following. Import the kill switch contract interface into your project. Store a variable named kill switch as type I kill switch dispatcher in the storage. Update the construction of the function to receive an additional input variable with the type contract address. Update the constructor function to initialize kill switch variable with a newly added input variable. Note that you need to use the I kill switch dispatcher with the expects a contract address as its type. So let's. So the idea here is that we need to we need to prevent the increased counter from working if an external smart contract actually returns false. If it returns true, then we actually can go ahead and increase the counter. I believe that's what it's trying to do. If or is available, the reconstruction permission. No. So far, just trying to collect the address of the kill switch. So it's going to be an external smart contract that we're going to be using inside the counter to interact with it. So first step, actually, I'm going to wait here a few minutes for you guys to give it a go. And then I go out and solve it. Uh, if you look at the scarf of tunnel, you're gonna see that there is a there's a dependency called kill switch that is actually pointing to this repo. That if we open it. You will switch. We see the code. What it does, it simply has one external function called is active that returns a Boolean. That's all it does. And give it a few minutes and then I'll solve it myself. Let me start completing this step. So let's take a look. Okay. So we want to be able to call this kill switch contract at some point in the future. And to be able to call a contract, we need to use, we need to have their dispatcher. Um, let's take a look at the Cairo book for a moment. And we can take a look at ABI interfaces. So this is the page that I'm looking at. So here you can see how to call it contract dispatchers. Just try to look for an example code. Yep. 
Here's one. So to call another contract, we need to use the, the dispatcher of, of its interface. So when we have this interface here defined, this macro actually generates some code. And what it does is generates code for a dispatcher to interact with the with the trade, with the interface. By importing the kill switch, we're gonna also get the dispatcher of that smart contract or that interface. Then we provide the address, and then we're able to actually call functions in the smart contract. So this is what we need to do, but for the kill switch, right? We need to find this dispatcher and we need to find the address. So let's see, we have to import the kill switch. So if I look at the scrub tumble, it should be available under the kill switch. Kill switch. And then let's see what's available. Uh, here's the kill switch dispatcher. That seems to be what we're looking for. Right? So the idea is that at some point in the construction, we're gonna get the address of where this was deployed. So here, let's call it the kill switch address. And of course, the type of this is contract address, which we need to import as well, bring into scope. Use Stargnet, I believe is from here, contract address, right? So we have the, in theory, the address, the right type. Now we need to derive the dispatcher from it. So we do I kill switch dispatcher, right? Similar as the, as the book, when we pass the contract address. So contract address is, is actually the kill switch address, right? And we can collect this as a dispatcher. And then we can actually store it. So let's store it here under kill switch. Switch, and the type will be the I kill switch dispatcher. And now we can actually save it. Counter, write, kill switch. And it's not working, why? Ah, because I call it dispatcher, right. And it's not working, why? Uh, because I put counter instead of kill switch. Okay, seems to be fine so far. Let's see what else we're being asked here. So import the kill switch control interface. We did it. We store it in this variable kill switch uh, in the storage with this type, yes. We update the constructor with a function to receive the, the address of the smart contract. And we initialize Yes, we actually store this type in this storage address of this type. Let's take a look. Let's try to run the test, see what happens. Yeah, it works. Questions so far? Chat, all good. Let me check YouTube. Okay. Okay, Nessera, could you explain one more time? Sure, no problem. So at some point we want to interact with this smart contract, the kill switch smart contract, the one that I show you here, right? This smart contract is actually deployed on Gurley. Uh, so the, the thing is, how do we call another smart contract from our smart contract, right? And the way to do it is by uh, grabbing its dispatcher, okay? And the dispatcher is available to us because we define 
this smart contract, the kill switch, to be a dependency of a project. And if you look at the, the, the repo for the kill switch, you can see that it has an interface called iKillSwitch annotated with this interface attribute. And this macro, what it does is that it generates automatically the iKillSwitch dispatcher, which is, let's say, the object that you can use to actually talk to it. So the only missing component to actually talk to the smart contract is to actually know where it was deployed, in which address, which is the thing that we need to provide when we actually deploy our counter smart contract. Does it make it a little more in easier to understand? So once I get the dispatcher, I actually put it in the storage just for able to use it later more easily. Any more questions? Okay, let's let's take a break, five minutes, and we come back to the rest of the workshop. Okay, I'll be here if you want to ask any questions, but let's take a break. It's eight oh four my time, so maybe we continue at eight ten. Douglas asking, what are the tests that is mentioned in this scoring system? Oh, Douglas, these are, if you go, you probably you were, were here in the session one and two. We actually, at the end of session one and at the end of session two, we actually had a test. Uh, it's like a, 10 questions with four different possible answers. So you had to pick one. Actually, it was multiple choice. But if you're not, if you're not here live during the session, you actually didn't see it. And we actually have some quizzes at the beginning as well, covering more like a reinforce what we learned in some of the sections. But if you weren't here, you can actually do the Node Guardians uh, quest to gain extra points and just compensate by not doing the tests. Oh, you left a little earlier. Yeah, that's okay. If you look at the points that you can actually get the bonus points, for example, the tests, they were 40 points in total, right? 20 points for test session one, 20 for session two. And you can get up to uh 65 extra points doing all these things in Node Guardians. And again, you only have to get 80% or more to get cum laude or 50% or more to get graduate. So you have a chance. This probably is pretty complex, the bad accounts, because probably is going to be talking about account contracts that we didn't cover. We talked about it in session one and two, but we haven't seen actually code. But if you're curious, actually, you can go to Starnet EDU mm, Medium. I have a series of articles talking about a kind of abstraction that might help you out.
Uh, Zach is saying that he's unable to join the Discord server. Yes, I, I saw a message on Discord that invites are paused until tomorrow. So try tomorrow tomorrow evening. Sometimes it happens just because uh, Discord gets under attack by scammers and even hackers. So the admins have to put some protection in place temporarily. Two more minutes and we continue. Uh, Jordan is saying, there's no method in Scrap.tumble to give the contract address for the kill switch dependency. Is the only purpose of this step three to code to give programmatic access to contract address of kill switch, even though this contract has one change? Why not hard code it in the text file? Right, so if I understand your question is, basically, why do we have to pass the address here instead of just maybe have it somewhere in the Scrap.tumble, like maybe somewhere here, right? I guess that's your question. And... And the reason is that you can you can deploy the exact same smart contract in multiple addresses. Remember that we first we declare the code and the deployment can be a million of them. It could be a million copies, all of them using the exact same interface, but all of them have a different address. Um, so why not put it here in the scrap the tunnel? I guess it's possible potentially, but again, it will create some coupling between the tooling, the scrap to tumble and the way that Starnet works. So that way you get more flexibility. You can actually use the same code and just, you deploy it, you just pass whatever uh, instance of the kill switch you actually want to use. If you recall back in session, I think one or two, we discussed about the difference between a class and an instance when it comes to smart contracts. So this is it. There, the instances are identified by its address. Does that answer your question? Great. Okay, A10, let's continue. So we are now in, we're gonna have to go to step four. Hit check out step four. Okay. Let's take a look at the requirement. So the goal here is to implement the kill switch mechanism in the increased counter by calling the is active function from the kill switch contract, right? Remember, that's the only function that the kill switch has. Requirements. If the function is active from the kill switch contract returns true, then allow the increased counter to increment the value. If the function is active and the kill switch contract returns false, then return without incrementing the value. And hence, you can access the is active function from your kill switch variable. Use this to create a logic in the increase counter function. So, a few minutes for you guys to solve it, and then I solve it myself. Nestor is asking, what about names for contracts that are multiple words? Let's say I want to name a contract counter contract. Should I name the file? Like a uh, okay Pascal case or a snake case, I'm asking because I see Rust style convention in the project. Yeah, that's a very good question that we keep debating. Uh, what is the right thing to do here? Uh, yeah. So so far the convention seems to be like for things like modules and interfaces to use Pascal case, but then for any function and variable to use a snake case. This is something that is just a convention. You can just follow your own convention. You can just put here a snake case if you want uh, in the kill switch, for example. But that's a good question because in Rust, everything is a snake case as far as saying, is it everything is snake case, even like enums? I think that uh, even in Rust, there's sometimes you use Pascal case. Uh, let's see, Rust, Pascal case, snake.
Right. So they say modules as snake case, which is actually different from what we're doing right now in Cairo, right? Because the smart contract is a module. But then for, for types, trades, and enums, they actually use Pascal case. Okay. So we actually bring a convention here. That's the only place. The rest we're actually following, more or less. But again, you can use your own convention, but that seems to be in the starting community, seems to be camel case for modules instead of snake case. That's the main difference with the um, Rust. Hey, if you want to see this, maybe that's a good thing to add to the Cairo book. You can get uh, some money by helping out. Just make sure to uh, sign up to only Doth first before you submit um, your fix or your new entry to the Cairo book. All right, has anyone completed uh, step, what is it, step four? Can you raise your hand or just let me in the chat? Let me know in the chat. Anyone? Give you two more minutes. We have it with autopilot. It's not able to complete this as well. So we have to use that kill switch contract somewhere here in this function, the increase counter. And we're getting some failures in step five. You're a little ahead. Okay, let me start solving this one. So the idea is that if the if the function is active from the kill switch returns true, then I'm allowed to increase the counter. If it doesn't return true, I actually just I don't increase the counter. So I'm gonna do it at the very beginning. First of all, I need to grab the dispatcher from the storage because the dispatcher is what I use to actually talk to the smart contract. In that dispatcher. Let's bring it here, dispatcher. Actually, I'm just going to call it kill switch. It's more specific. And it's going to be equal to self kill switch. This is the storage variable. If we read, right? We have it here. So now I'm actually, I don't, I can do like kill switch. Now I can call the function is active. Look that I get autocomplete which is nice. And I'm gonna use this instead of an if statement. Right. So I don't think I need the... I'm gonna put it anyway. Okay, so if this returns true, that is active, then I'm allowed to do all this increase. If not, nothing happens. This is something that I requested the author of the workshop to modify. Uh, it's a more common pattern that if you cannot do the action, you actually uh, revert, you stop and revert the transaction with an assert. It is not what the the test or, or the step is requiring, so I'm not gonna do it now because it will fail the test. But just keep in mind that it will be more common to do like something like else and then some assertion and, and, and fails. Or just do assert here, sorry. Instead so of the if statement to the assert here. But anyway, I'm not gonna do it now because it will fail a test. Carlos saying actually AI interaction with Cairo is so poor, that is why we need Cairo Mancer. Yeah, I actually I'm trying to use ChatGPT to get some out of the with Cairo, and it's like it doesn't know, it seems to only know old Cairo, not new Cairo. I haven't tried Copilot yet. Uh let's try now run the test. Scarp test. Let me just clear the screen. Scott, test. Yeah, 
it works. Question before we move on to step five. Step five. Let's take a look. So the goal here is to implement an event named counter increased, which emits the current value of the counter. Then we have to emit this event when the counter variable has been successfully incremented. And we, they gave us as a hint, events are custom data structures that are emitted by a contract. More information about events can be found in this chapter of the book. Uh, go back. Don't take me away. Close some. Yeah. So they are showing here how to create events, and that is a good example of how events are actually created in a smart contract. You have a top level enum called event that can have a multiple entrance but each entrance is actually a struct of the same name. I believe it has to be the same name. And then you define those structs uh, below with these attributes, right? And your event can have multiple, uh, let's say, arguments, and you can define which one of them are keys to be indexed. And then when you want to use it, you call it like this self.emit, the, the, the variant of the enum, and then the values of the arguments. So I'll give you a few minutes for you guys to solve it, and then I'll go solve it myself. I feel like we are going to be able to only fit, finalize this workshop plus the deployment to testnet because I have to show you how to use um, cast or, or SN cast, uh, the CLI to interact with Stargate. Nestor is asking, in Cairo, do we have a limit on the event fields locked like in Solidity? Um, actually, it's a good question. I don't know. What is, what's the limit in Ethereum? Is it a limit in the events or in the keys? Like in, in event fields or in the keys? There's something here. No, it doesn't say anything. Oh, in the keys, then you can only have like a maximum three keys if I believe in Solidity. Uh, I don't know, but I'm gonna assume that it's the same limit because it doesn't make sense from a database perspective to have way too many keys. Uh, it's very inefficient, the indexing. But you can try <laughs> multiple indexes to see what happens. But uh, I wanted to bet that it's a similar restriction. Let me know if you finished, you can raise your hand. Just let me know in the chat. If you have the step five actually running the test. Andre, did you manage to fix the issue you had in step five? All right, cool, you fix it. So I was asking, if the kill switch had a write function, can I still use it in the same way? You can, but that's a good way to, it's a good question because, let me go back to the counter contract. So the question is that, oh, I closed the kill switch. Anyway, if the kill switch had another function that actually modified the state, can I use it here? Well, in this case, you, you will be able to, yes, because this function is actually also modified the state. The, the thing that I'm not sure is that if this function were using like a read-only version using a snapshot, I don't think you should be able to be able to call a function that modify the state. 
but I haven't tried. But in, in, in theory, in this function in particular, yes, you should be able to call any function, either it's a read only or write as well. The main difference is that functions that are read only, like for example, get counter, you can actually interact with them using what is called just a call, right? Which you, you don't pay any gas, it's not a transaction, you're just reading the state, so it's for free. But anytime you interact with a function that actually modifies the state, like this one, you actually have to pay gas fees for the execution. Okay, let me start solving this step five. Uh, so we need to create an event called counter increased, okay? So if I look at the docs, I know that I have to create uh, this enum call event. So I'm just gonna copy this as a, yeah. And I'm just gonna modify it. So I'm gonna go here at the top. Where do I put it maybe? And, but now the events are different, right? I, it's gonna call increased counter and the struct needs to be of the same name. What's the name, right? Increased counter that is asking. I oh, know, counter increased. Oops. Counter increased. No, okay. So now we define the struct from here. And what do we need in the in the event actually? just to emit the current value. It's not even asking to provide the old value. So the only thing that requires counter, which is U32. In this case, it doesn't make sense to have the counter as a key. It's just a value, it's nothing that you want to be indexed. So this will be how do you define the event. This is the main enum where you, you can have multiple types of events in the same smart contract. But then for each one of them, you have to define, okay, what are the values and which ones are the keys? So now to use it, the idea is that when I increase the counter, I emit the value. So it will need to be inside this if clause. So here I can do self dot is it emit. And then I pass the, is that how it works? I mean, look at the book. I define the struct name and the values, okay. So the struct name was counter increased and it's expecting uh, it's a, it's a struct, so it's expecting the counter property, which in this case will be new counter. Right, that sounds about right. So we define the event, we define the, so define the event, define the cost, the, 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 the struct with the value we want to define, and then we actually emit it if only we increase the counter. Let's see. Yes, it works. Any question? Okay, that in theory, that's actually the end of the workshop. It only tells you to go to step six, just you can see the previous solution. So let's just do that. Just for completeness, to check out step six. Uh, Logan is asking, any idea why I get a failure? There should be one key. It's asking you to actually have one key. That's so strange. Ibrahim, yes, I can see your message. Uh, so if that's the case, well, you can add a key, but doesn't really make a lot of sense. So you get that error running the key here. I had that error too, but then you remove the key. Oh, you have to remove the key. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah.
Yeah, this is how I define mine. No key attribute. Why in this case we don't use a key? Because for key, you want something that is, is meant to be unique, like an address. It's usually an address that you use as a key. Uh, counter is actually a value because the key is used for indexing. This At the end, this goes to a database, it goes indexed. So you need to use your criteria to what things are supposed to be keys and what things are just values. Uh, if I send me the DMs, yeah, you can send me DMs on Twitter. My Twitter is right at David. Uh, you can send me on Twitter there. Uh, all right. So what I want to show you now is how to actually take this smart contract and deploy it to testnet and then interact with it directly on, on Gerald in this case. So we actually have right now the the CLI with each S and cast. Uh, you should have the same as well. So if you recall from previous sessions, in order to deploy a smart contract, we have to first uh, declare it, then deploy it, and then we can actually uh, invoke it. So let me open first the documentation for Starnet Foundry. Because I'm gonna have to use a lot of the book to guide me. So this is the docs I'm gonna be using. I'm gonna put it here in the chat. And increase the font size. Oops, not here, this one. And I can go and take a look at cast. This is S in forge, S in cast commands. All right. So because to declare and to deploy and to invoke, we have to pay for gas fees. And to pay for gas fees, we need to have a smart contract, sorry, uh, a wallet associated or a, a smart wallet in particular. So with CAS, we can either create a completely new one that is managed by CAS, or we can add one that we already have. Uh, in this case, uh, like a Bravos uh, wallet that you have, that you can just connect to standard CAST and use that to pay for gas fees. That is my preferred way because that way you can actually keep track easier of how much money you have left. And it's nice just to be able to connect a regular wallet with uh, your CLI. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that right now, SNCast only supports smart wallets written in Cairo zero, not in Cairo one yet. That means that you cannot use Argent X at the moment, because Argent X actually using Cairo One, you will have to use Bravos. Because all this, all the accounts in Bravos are actually right now Cairo Zero. Eventually, they will become Cairo One, but for now it's Cairo Zero. That's the one that is supported by SNCast. So you see that I have here uh, an account called Deployer on Girly. So make sure that it's in Girly. We don't want to deploy to main it. To we want to pay real, real money. Uh, I got this little bit of uh, ETH from the faucet. Mm, this is the faucet. So, okay, let me take a look at my docs. Okay. So if I take a look at the SNCast command for add, so import an account to account file. So actually we have to pass multiple arguments. We have to pass the URL of the RPC that we're gonna to use to interface with the sequencer. If you recall from the architecture discussion, you don't talk directly to the sequencer, you talk is to an RPC and that RPC works in your behalf to actually talk to, to the sequencer. And sometimes the RPC directly gives you the answer you're looking for. So we need to create, uh, have a an URL for an RPC that we can use. And there are multiple ways to have it. You can use Infura, you can use Alchemy, you can use Blast, but I'm gonna use this time Voyager. You can actually go to Voyager online, which is the blog explorer. And you can create an account, right? I'm gonna sign in with my credentials. So my 
email. It's free to create an account. And I'm going to create a new key, right? An API key to use the RPC. Philip is asking, what is the difference between SNCAS and using Starglide? Um, those are two different tools. Uh, both are CLIs for Starglide, so you can use either one. I think the benefit of Starglide is that it supports Caro One uh, or, or smart wallets within Caro One. It's just I don't want to go through the process of, of installing yet another dependency because SNCAS already come pre-installed with uh, Starglide Foundry. That's the only reason that I'm using it right now. But Starglide is a really good choice as well. So make it a new key. Uh, let's call it this uh, Basecamp because I'm going to remove it after we finish. And I get the key. Continue. Let me open this. So, okay. So we want to use uh, Girly, right? And Juno is which particular, that, that is the client, the RPC client they actually use. So I'm going to copy this. Let me for now, I'm just going to get a new file just called commands. Just some place temporarily to write things down before I actually send the commands. So this will be the URL, but to use the API key, I actually have to pass like this. And then I paste the actual key. The API key is something that you don't you don't share with anyone. I'm just gonna put it here and then delete it after we finish this um, workshop. So make sure you use your your own API key. That will be the URL flag, right? If we go back to the SNCast, if we open this, it will be with this URL flag. So the command will be something like SNCast account. Sorry, SNCast. I have here. This will be the URL. And then we actually, the command we're going to execute will be count add. And we continue taking a look at the other options. So we have to define the name of uh, the, the, the account we're creating here and the address where it was deployed. Those are the two required properties. So let's go declare the name. I'm going to call it Bravos. And then the address, I'm going to go ahead and just copy. Remember that it has to be Bravos because it's a Cairo Zero account that is currently supported. And it has to be an address on Girly, not on main. Just make sure that you, know, you have this set up to Girly. OK, I think that's all. So the URL, the name, the address, and I think I have missing something else. Oh, OK, right. We need to provide a private key of that particular account. So I'm just showing this because this is a throwaway thing that only has nine test ETH or nine test dollar. But the way to show it here will be, if I remember, show private key. Uh, copy. Again, I don't mind showing this because this is just doesn't have anything. Uh, so I go back to my command. It's going to be the private key. It's there. Let's see what else do we need. Uh, and <laughs> let's add profile. So this will create an entry inside the Scrap the tunnel. Let's give it a try. I'm going to copy this whole command. Let's put it here. Hey, whole thing failed. Isn't isn't guys require a subcommand that one was not provided? Uh, why, 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 why? Oh, wait. I'm missing all the backspaces. So it's a multi line command. Try again. Uh, 
All right, this time it worked. So if I go to scarf.toml, you can see that there's a, uh, wait, anything added? Yes. We have this new entry, tools.sncat.bravos, that defines the account, where it's been stored, and the URL of the RPC server. So that way, next time we use SNCast, we don't have to provide all those values by hand to make it a little shorter. And so next step is actually now let's declare the smart contract. So make sure that you build it, the project. Should be built already, but just in case. So now we actually go to the declare. So let's take a look at the declare here, right? So for this command, we need to know the contract name as defined in the contract file. And then that's it. Okay, so that will be sncast um, declare. We do need to provide the profile, right? Which one do we have to use? We have to use this one, Bravos. So normally you will have to do something like this, P, and then you define which profile within this card of Tumble to use. But an even better way is that if you remove this part here, it becomes the default wallet. So I can just get rid of that part of the command, just do as in declare. And it needed the name of the contract, which is just contract, name of the module. Uh, wait, I missed something. I need to pass the flag contract name. So minus C. Counter. There is no contract at the specified address. What? Lowercase? No, it's to be uppercase. And yeah, let me take a look. Hmm. What am I doing wrong here? What am I doing wrong? There's no contract at the specified address. As it cast. Declare. What if I use the full name? Contract name. It's not going to work. That I haven't seen this error. Is anyone getting the same issue? Counter is called, yeah, that's the name. Okay, this is the issue of the live coin. In the activity, no activity yet. Wait, I wonder if that's not deployed yet. It's just deployed. Take a look at the Voyager one more time. I wonder if my wallet's been deployed actually. There's nothing here. My yeah, girly. Yeah, I don't think this is deployed. So what I'm gonna do, maybe they actually doing the same as 
Argent now that they only deploy when you do the first transaction. So I'm going to send some funds to another wallet that I have. Give me a sec. Argent. It's in here. Let's say deposit. Uh, no. Send. Send to this address 0 0.002. One. Oh yeah, now it's deploying the account. Now one that was not working. Remember that a smart wallet needs to have the UI and also the account contract deployed. That's the thing that we were missing. That's the error that we're looking at. So now that we sent the data transaction, it actually went through and also deployed the account contract and should be available now. Yes, accepted on L2. All right, let's try again. Uh, just to see. Okay, now it worked. We have a transaction hash and then we have a, the class hash, right? Remember that when we declare, we actually get a class hash. And from the class hash, we can actually deploy instances using the universal deployer. So that is the next step. So if we take a look at the docs again to deploy, what it needs is the class hash and nothing else, which is the flag G. Okay. So I can do SN cast deploy minus G. Oh, I think I need something else as well. Pretty sure. Because it's going to need the constructor call data, right? Which basically we need to pass, need to pass the, the, the initial value for the counter and the address of the kill switch. So let's go. I'm going to copy this again to my commands. Do not lose it. Mm -mm. So deploy. This is the class hash. Now we pass, what is the name? The C, construction call data. So the first value is the initial value of the counter. Let's say it initialized with one. And now we need the address of the kill switch where it was deployed in testnet. And I believe that is in the exercise here somewhere. Yeah. This is the address where it was deployed. So I'm going to put it here. This is the second parameter of the constructor. Um, that should be it. Let's try. Put the backslash. Let's try running this. And yes. It was deployed, it is deployed now to this address. So if we go to Voyager again, and paste it here, we can see our smart contract being deployed. That it has, it, it takes some time to index the smart contract correctly. That's why it's not showing here yet. But we can actually interact with it with the CLI, uh, I guess, well. So I mentioned that you can actually interact with the read-only functions like get counter using a call, which is free, you don't pay gas fees. So let's do this first. Let's try to interact with get counter and get the current value. Uh, so that will be a call. And here we need to specify the address where it was deployed, our counter smart contract which function we want to call the get counter and the arguments, if there's any, which in your case, there's no arguments to be passed to the function. All right, so SN cast call, and we pass the address, which, oh, I almost lost it here. 
address, and then we have to pass the function name, which is the get counter. And I think that's it. All right. And we get the value one. That is the value that we pass as the to initialize the counter. So it is working correctly. Next step will be to increase this counter. Now we need to use an invoke transaction and we actually have to pay gas fees for it. So let's take a look at the invoke. Close some of the things that I have open here. I don't need this, I don't need that. That's still processing. Okay, now it's actually showing you. Here's increase counter for in read for get counter. If we query, we get the same value. So to do the invoke, we again need the same, the contract address, again, the function. Now we're gonna have call data. No, not we're, gonna, we're not gonna have call data either in this case because our function actually doesn't expect anything to be passed. So it will be as in cast pretty much the same. You just instead of getting counter, we're gonna call the increase counter. And instead of being call, it will be invoke. The transaction went through. So if this actually worked, if we call again the same the get counter, we should now get 0x2. So let's check that this transaction actually is finalized before we attempt to continue. Let me duplicate this. Yes, accepted on L2. This is the L2 finality. So if I just repeat as in cast, get counter, now we get two. So that completes how to use as in cast to declare, deploy, call, and invoke. And in this case, remember that as in cast only works with um, accounts that are Cairo zero. That's why I can, I can only uh, import Bravos into this example. I couldn't import Argent X. But if you really want to use a Cairo one wallet, you can use a Stark Lie, which is another project, another CLI, Stark Lie. That I believe it does support Cairo one as well. So this is another CLI. It's similar to Cast, maybe even more powerful, has more options, but it works a little bit differently. All right, we made it to the end of Basecamp. I'm glad that we have all of you here, 26 people. So we didn't have time, obviously, to do the other workshop, but you can do it on your own if you want to. It's not gonna be part of the homework. This is only if you want to keep pushing yourself. We have this ownable workshop in a very similar format with the steps. We also have the Docker. And if you would want to get into account abstraction, we have this other workshop. So there's three workshops, I mean, two more that you can do on your own. Again, download homework, just do it if you want to. And remember to use uh, do node guardians quest if you want to get extra points. Until February 9th, I accept submissions for homework and uh, extra points for the guardians. After that, I'm just going to calculate uh, how many points you will get. And then on Discord, I'm going to share the link for you to go and claim your POAP. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoy it. And oh, yeah, time for questions. Uh, Nestor, how can we get the events with S and cast? I don't see a command. It's a good point. That's a good point. I've never tried to actually get events from a CLI. I wonder if this tagline has something like that. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I don't I don't recall even seeing that. But if you find it on the Starlight, please do let me know. It could be on Discord. That will be useful. Jordan, thank you very much for attending. Oh, this uh, link to the Discord, sure, I can share it again. You can find it if you go to starnet.io, uh, the main website. You can go to, oh, to community. 
and you see here the link to Discord. So just copy the link and paste it. Logan's asking, will next week be the last session for the base camp? No, today was the last session. This one was uh, only four sessions for the whole base camp. So this is the end. Pablo, thank you very much. It's 2 a.m. in your plane where you are. I will check everything later and get the submissions done. Yeah, I'll put this recording in on the on the YouTube channel for the Stagnant Foundation. We have a playlist. Uh, so you can check it out later, the recording. Thank you, Falco. Thank you all. That's all. There's no test for today, so you can just safely abandon the call. It's been great to, to have you all here. Hopefully, I get, to, I get to see some of you in Denver in a couple of weeks' time. All right. Bye-bye. Take care, guys.